Anything that describes the audience is descriptive statistics. Most everything else where we run tests, like where I said a regression test would tell you what's the biggest predictor, that's inferential because it infers something. We can't see it by looking at the data, but the tests infer something to us. Honestly, the descriptive statistics are, you gotta do it. You gotta tell your audience who it was you interviewed or who took the survey. But the inferential is where all the great information comes from. You know, what do the tests tell you that you didn't know, okay? Um, reliability testing, have you haven't done this yet? Internal consistency. Here's where my thing screwed up. I have run this wellness scale I showed you a number of times, it has no reliability. It does not work. Right. If that means those questions, even though they look good, they do not work together, right? So in better terms, when the software like SPSS looks at it, and I think it like, let's say it looks at the pattern, how everybody <coughs> answered each one of those questions, it doesn't work right. There's really poor reliability, which is probably not a very good scale. It's hard to defend it because it didn't work well together, okay? Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you do a big study and your data is junk. And then you start to have to figure, well, what's left in here I can use besides throwing it out? Because you don't want to throw out a study. So sometimes this one did not work well as a scale, which was the first sort of defeat. That's called a Kronbach. Have you done Kronbach Alpha before? So you stick all these items, those whatever I had, eight or 10, you push the button under reliability testing, and it'll kick out a Kronbach Alpha. All you gotta remember is 0.7 is great marginal, barely defendable, 0.8 or bigger is good. So if you hit that, you got a 0.89 alpha, you're strong, that thing works great. Mine was like a 0.57. So you can you kind of really defend it. You can def I looked in research, you can sort of argue down to 0.6, but even then you're in the weeds. 0.57 is my point, you can't. So it wasn't that good of a scale that way, but that's, you gotta measure it if you use questions together. Factor it, have you factored before, okay? See, remember those items I just showed you? All factoring is, is it looks at how everybody answered and it sticks them in buckets. Okay. Can you see that a little bit? I need, these are how it factored. Relaxation, relationships, and positive emotion was one of the most powerful clusters. See these up here? Those are called latent variables. You make those names up. This is the selling part of research. If you see relationships, relaxation, and positive emotion in one place, what would you call that? I call it recharge. Because it's sort of, a, you know, you're selling your ideas, you're right? Peer pressure, stress, work negative, and financial, academic detractors. See how those are all negative? They all cluster together. And then these are all power, you know, based on power, that was the most powerful in this. And weaker down here was feel appealing in exams which is interesting that those two, think of this, bad exams, I don't feel appealing, right? So that's called tough tests, and I just named them. That's factoring. So right there is a factor model, and that's something you can make, and I built this in a program called Onyx. Onyx, it's open source. Uh, but you can build these and test them, and then say, there's also, by the way, results on this to say if that factored properly, but there you go. And that would be an image or graphic. Make sense? So that's factoring. Um, predictive models. This, this is something we really haven't done much around here. And I started learning it. It's, I figured out how to do enough shortcuts that I can do it. Otherwise, if I don't have the shortcuts, I sort of, like that program SAS I told you about, I can't do it there. I tried, it's so hard that I can't run it. I ran one decision tree in at once and it took me like seven hours to run one just because I, I'm really stubborn about software beating me. I will not give up when software beats me. So I keep, finally I found a YouTube where somebody was saying, here's how you do it. That's what it took to do it, and I finally figured it out. But seven hours to run one test, that's not good, is it? So I said, I'm not doing that anymore. So, but you, there's another way, okay? And there's a couple different models for decision trees, and I'll make this pretty simple. Decision tree is the big headline of it all. Classification tree, this is pretty simple. If the dependent variable, the thing you're testing at at the bottom, is binomial, that they call it, that's two. It's dichotomous or binomial, that's two. Yes, no. Agree, disagree. Uh, like it, hate it. If you had an answer like that, you're testing against that. That's called binomial. That's a classification tree. Just remember that part. Regression tree is almost the same, but that would be like, if I had a one to seven variable, let's say I took my religiosity scale and I want to measure against religiosity, that's like a five or seven point scale. 
That's a regression tree because you're testing against a multi-point scale. That's as simple as I can make it. There's two kinds of trees, okay? So dependent and have you talked about dependent and independent variables? I always get mixed up. But basically, dependent is what you're testing against. That's all I have to remember. You know, if you put religiosity as a dependent, everything you're looking at is how people feel based on religion. If you put urban rural on the bottom, everything you're testing is talking about how people feel about urban and rural where they live. Does that make sense? Everything else you test against the dependent is the independent. Uh, I talked about this a little bit. I'm just learning this. This is this last two weeks. I've been working with a student on this. See where if you have a I'll just be real simple. If you have a three, five, or seven scale, what's almost always in the middle of those? Can you remember if it's strongly disagree? Uh, let's see, strongly disagree, disagree, then what would you get? Neutral. Neutral. No opinion, neutral. They're junk. Because they really, if you go two or four, you call, it's called a forced, um, a forced response. Because there is no neutral in the middle. You're either going to be on the not so good side or the good side. So what I'll say this, in decision trees, you want them to split. Decision trees tell you how the thing splits. If you use a two or four point, everything's got to split positive or negative. If you've got that neutral in the middle, you might hit neutral and then it might just not even test well because neutral means frankly nothing, right? It just means I'm in the middle, I don't know. So I've been using more of these two fours, sort of the um, uh, the ones without the, the positive or the false neutral in the middle. I just think it tests better. So I hope that was, I don't want to get too much out of that, okay? Um, this is a four point scale. Just for instance, not at all, very little, somewhat to a great extent. Now you can see if it falls down on these bottom two, it's not perfect because this is none and this is very little. But still, that's sort of this group and then somewhat to a great extent is the other side. The idea here is it's trying to split it. Okay. And the, that's what a decision tree does, it splits the tree. Okay. All right, I don't even know if you can see this. Can you see a little bit? This is that wellness scale testing for urban or rural. That would be a classification tree, because it's urban <coughs> world, right? Two point. So I'm going to make this as easy as I can. The first thing I do is see where these percentages are. That's collecting what group of people think a certain way. Okay. So up here is 100%. If I look at exams, here it says, if exams is greater than 4.5, you got to think about this. On a seven scale, Greater than 4.5 is saying these people answered that exams are a big deal, right? Exams affect, that's up in the gr agree, strongly agree on the scale, right? So you got to, it's sort of, you got to interpret a little bit in your mind. But this one says, if exams are really important, and that's yes, then they go over here. 79% of that group feels that exams is the big deal. That breaks it. But then we can go down farther. And then if you just take it, like, let's say, I'm going to make it simple. Then let's go down to 50%. That's probably the biggest other group. So here's what we know. If exams are a big deal and financial situation is greater than 5.5, real big deal. Here's what we know. For 50% of the audience, exams and financial situation are what drives their wellness. Does that make sense? So you can look at that. You just got to sort of look at the tree and I always look at what's the biggest groups collected. See, you can go down, here's 10%, 3%, 12 And you can see the smaller the group gets, the more decisions are made to get down there. But you can't report everything. That's the thing about research. you got to pick what's really good to report. So I'd probably, I'd report this in this tree based on urban, this is based on urban and rural people. They think exams and financial situation. you got to remember it's testing for urban and rural based on that opinion. Okay? So let's see what else I did. This one was based on gender. Same type of items of wellness, but this is based on how, how gender affects it. So here, let me see. If you don't, once again, if exams are a big deal, it collects 79%. And let's see, let's take it down to 30. So exams are a big deal. Stress is a really big deal. And then relaxation and rest isn't a real good collector, because look at this, less than, less than 6.5 is virtually the whole scale almost, right? So that's a little weak, and sometimes here it's hard to predict that. But you could say based on gender, exams and stress are the two big things. So these are decision trees in the simplest sense. 
If you're interested, remember that R program I told you? There's an add on, there's two add ons, one called Rattle and one called Radiant. Radiant is the best, and it's pretty easy to use. It's intuitive, and you can open that as an add on in R and run a lot of these. You could plug it in, hit the button, it'll run these trees. If you could even say you're running decision trees, you're going to get, you're out there, you're, you're already a step above. If you can go into any interview on a comm and say, I'm running decision trees, I know what a classification or regression tree is. It, it means something. People will respect that. Okay? And if not, even if you don't run them, you may be in a meeting someday that someone rolls this out because almost every one of you is going to have an analyst come into a meeting and tell you what's going to happen based on predictions, right? So they'll come in and they may roll out a tree, and you may not be perfect at running it, but if you saw one of these now, you might know what's going on in a meeting. That might be enough. Okay. Uh, let's see. One more. Current GPA. Same thing. Let's see what happened here. Current GPA. Okay. I'm collecting for, let's see. 55%. So based on GPA, it says not listen to my body. So listen to my body is going this way. So this way saying, um, it's not really about that. But again, exams comes up as the big thing. Would that make sense? If exams is the big split, if you're GPA oriented, it's testing for that, this is everything. You might even suffer um, ill effect, you might have bad relationships, you might work too much, but in this case, exams is the one thing that's gonna drive your. So sometimes you'll find things that are just common sense. There may be nothing there that's really unique, but you just look at all this stuff and when you see something that maybe is inferential, then that's what you would report. Okay, so it's, honestly, it's a lot of a game. You gotta think about how do you sell your ideas, how do you sell your research? And that's what most data scientists cannot do well, and you can because you're in communication. Okay. Oh, let's see. Uh, let's see, I don't remember what this one was next. So, okay, last thing, unrelated, text analysis. You might hear a lot about text analysis. It's, the, it's really what's coming out. Have you heard of sentiment analysis? Okay, let's say you work for Pepsi, okay, and they're, what was the, what's the Jenner girl that got in all, what was that crap you want? She Highly, which Jenner made that, do you remember that ad that went really bad? I think she it was, was Kendall a, Jenner. What was yeah. it called? Uh, I don't even know what it was called. It well, was what, on air for like a day. Right, <laughs> you know what's in, remember it was sort of about a protest and it went uh -huh. really bad. The interesting part of that ad is, you know who did that ad? In-house Pepsi people did that ad. That wasn't even the agency, so it shows the danger of who's doing what for a company. That was in-house Pepsi. There was some in-house people that did that. Not OMD, not the big agencies. Okay. That ran, so let's say you know you're in trouble and you're the big PR crisis people. There's something you can do that is called scraping. It's something where it could go into Twitter, and let's say you're scraping for Jenner plus Pepsi. Okay. It'll scrape all the tweet content for as much as you want. You want millions of them, it'll scrape it all. You dump that into these data plans and it'll give you sentiment analysis, which will tell you in almost all cases of people how they're reacting positively or negatively to those tweets. So you'll watch real time as these things, because you can imagine if you have it turned on, they're hitting by the thousands. And you can watch the sentiment go up or down, positive or negative. That's what a lot of companies do now. They use sentiment now just to track their social media content to know how people are thinking, right? So I've been playing with it just a little bit. And there's a couple, here's another one, KH Coder. Open source runs with R. This is invented by a Japanese scientist who, by the way, emailed me. I can, you email these inventors, they'll email you back. Almost all these scientists that invent these softwares, they'll answer your questions. So I emailed him about how to report it. He was quite helpful. But he built all this that you plug it in and it runs in R. It just runs, which is pretty amazing to me, okay? So this is, um, let me see what this one was. I gotta remember. I did a study with first year seminar students and this was an essay question on leadership. They wrote on, I'll just tell you to set up. Here's the deal. Oh, we're almost out of time too, okay. So I asked them this question. You're on a hike with your friend. One group of your friends falls back because they can't keep up. 
another group comes up and starts ridiculing the slower walkers for being not being able to go fast enough. What do you do? So it was sort of a leadership bullying essay. Okay. So 33 students wrote this. I dumped in all the data. This sort of shows it multidimensionally. It collects different factors. It's based on what words they said and how those words went together. So you can see it. And this is really hard to interpret at times, but look up here. Active, life, ability, activity. So this is sort of what they were doing, I think. And then up here, conflict, believe, roll, stop. So I'm thinking there they're trying to stop a bad activity. Again, this is neat graphics, but it's sometimes hard to interpret. But at least it's showing you how the words all came out together. Okay? This is called a co-occurrence network from the same group. These are called edges. And this here says, same type of thing. Here's how the words go together, but the darker the edge, the stronger the connection. Okay? So we can see right in here, you know, look at this situation. Help, ridicule, person, leader. So see, they viewed this as what was happening. And look how, how a leader comes, leadership in my role. So in a co-occurrence network, it can get a little messy, but the idea is, see, this was residence, life, community, member, live, active. So this is them up. Can you see how the words sort of clustered out and went together? So this is called co-occurrence. Okay. All right. Last thing, let's see. This is called concordance. If you do this type of work and you think of one word that's really important, right? I typed in bully. It pulls up every time the word bully was used in context. You can look at that and say, let's look at it. How were people thinking about bully? I could go back up there and put leader in, and it would pull it all out for leader. This is a real fast way to do a text. You can look really deeply into how people are. You can't see that when you read 33 essays. Plug in bully, you can see exactly how they were talking about the context of bully. Okay? Last thing. These are these surveys. This is called linguistic inquiry and word count. You put it in there, you hit the button. It kicks this out. Really simply. Analytic, clout, authentic, and tone. Those are the big four. It's telling me on a 100-point scale how analytic the person was. I can go right down the line here. Here's one. Uh, let's see, here's a 65. If I look in that, that's a highly analytic person. Okay, clout. It's the kind of, you know, clout could be a, sort of the authority you carry. I can go, here's a 73. There's a high clout person, 69. So all this does is take, somehow takes all these words and kicks out exactly how people are thinking. There's like 30 of these. All different kinds of things, how they feel, present tense, past tense, depression. Tells you all that about them. So I'm just starting to learn this, but I mean, so what? If it gives you all this data, what do you do with it, right? And that's what I'm learning how to do. Okay. Last thing and I'm done. I helped a friend write a chapter in a book on religiosity in movies. Sometimes you come up with weird stuff. I had to show you this. Great. Here's how many times they attend church. So you can see these dots. Here's, you know, not too often, quite a bit. I think this was several times a month. This is how much they experience the divine. After you go to church too much, it starts falling off. <clears throat> Isn't that cool? I mean, up here people are getting, getting divine. Uh-oh, I'm going too much. I must be getting bored or burned out. Because they lose the divine coming off there. So that's a simple relationship between two variables, but just playing around, I thought, that's something we put in the book chapter. It's interesting to think about. So if you were running a church, you'd say, let's not have them go more than a couple times a month because everything's not going to go well. So. <laughs> all right, sort of time. That's all I, I talked really fast, but that's all I have to say. Thank you. Oh, I should ask you a question. I don't know if you do or not. I sometimes I know them, but sometimes I don't know what the answers are. Yeah. Yep. When you were talking about qualitative data, with like the wellness interview, did you ever have to count for people like not being truthful or people being unaware that they're truthful? Here's the deal. If you're really good at this, like one time I was working on a Napa Auto Parts account. To do it right, you get a focus group in like 12 major markets. You make sure it's the right people. You fly all over the country. You have a moderator. That's doing it right, so you're really making sure you're collecting all the right people and the right data. Honestly, at the student level, you're right. You might have bias. You might have people that for that day are not really in a good state of wellness versus are a good state, so yeah. That's the problem with student research is it's not always really you know, as good as it could be, but if you had 100 grand, things go a lot better.
<laughs> focus groups about 150 grand to run one of those. So if you have the money, you pay to do it. But you're right. You can't always correct for that. Hope you're excited about it. I like research. I like playing with the software. I like learning things. So here's the last question before you go. I was talking to Dr. Gray about this. Is this too much for your, your level? What are you, what's your appetite for this type of thing at this level? Good, bad? Yeah. I mean, to the point you're interested, or is it just so shooting so far out there that's not really interesting? I think it's interesting, but I found a lot of what you said just kind of like went over my head. But it was cool. I just well, didn't have all see, of it. See, because I'm trying to, I'm actually bringing it down four notches mm -hmm. from the business school, but I'm still trying to say, how do you talk about it and still make it interesting without it being yeah, data? Yeah. Well, I think that's also kind of why, like, our role like in where we're at like just like taking this class and stuff is important because like as like we are doing exercises and stuff and gathering information we don't know like nearly as much right. as you so it's a lot easier for us to dumb it down because that's all we know like okay. that's all we know how to like understand it in here's one last qu with this question mm -hmm. would it be better if you just learned about it or is it still better to do it because i collect data we run these tests bad for better or worse we try to run these tests and this year i'm doing decision trees who knows how it'll go it could be a disaster but we're going to try so is it better to try or is it better just to learn about it i think the best way to learn anything is to try it and practice it okay. even if it like slightly goes over our head you like you at least try to do it or like okay understand a little bit but yeah. if you just teach it to me then i won't i would never feel that, that's understand. fair because you know the other side of this is they call data visualization you know on the back side you turn all of this into some hot graphics and we'll sell it right mm -hmm. so some people say we should just be teaching visualization but one last thing i have a lot of students that go into small business and i've had several tell me i was in my small business and i started talking about the things we learned in 3928 and guess what now i'm the company research person so they did it it's small business there's not a big money. So you may be that person. You may be in a small business and you're it. Mm -hmm. And my always thing is, remember methodology? Could you do this on your own, on a small scale? Could you do it? Because that could be a job for some people. A lot of, there's hundreds of small businesses that need. Low, I always saw Joe's Plumber. Joe's Plumber needs to know a little bit about his customers. You might work at Joe's Plumber. There's 10 people working there, but you might be the person that has to do the research. So that's what I think. I hope you can. And if you don't, it's going to cross your path guaranteed in your career as an agency. It's going to come in here. Um, there's more analysts than creative now in most agencies. So it's just the way it's going to go. You're out of time here. 10, is that the end of time? Um, oh, wait, wait, it's not 10.45. Oh, I got a lot of time. I thought we were done at 10. Well, I guess I'm done anyway. I thought was, For some reason, I thought it was 10.15, <laughs> but I guess we are a lot of time. I didn't have anything else to say anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I have some other data sets, though. I, I have that text in it. That student study, I did this essay. They didn't know this. They did that essay the first day of class, and they didn't know this, but they did the exact same essay the last day of class. So I've got pre-post, right? I've got pre and post, and I'm trying to determine with text analysis what has changed in their leadership, in their thinking. But I've, in honest, I've never reported text analysis, and there's not much to tell me how to do it. So I'm sort of struggling on that. But that's where that study is. That data is just sitting there. And uh, I don't know. We're going to collect that PEP data in our other class. Now, are you going to collect data in here? Dr. Gray, are you collecting? Yeah. Yeah. Not not together. Um, we're They're doing separate small projects. They're doing a secondary analysis project where they're looking at um, published data and answering a question or testing hypothesis and making recommendations or answers based on that. Then they're doing one qualitative project, very small, either interviews or autoethnography. And then they're doing one small quantitative project, either um, a content analysis of Twitter or a uh, survey. And then they will be analyzing it and presenting one of those primary projects at the end of the semester. Okay. So they're in small groups doing their own thing. The other thing I thought of in the simple, you know, the people that are really good at this, the best work all in Excel because they're geniuses. Everything's coding and their formulas, but a lot of the really good ones just stay right in Excel. If you go to use Google Sheets, if you all use Google Sheets at all, 
If you ever look on top, there's a thing called add-ons. <laughs> look at those add-ons. I found a bunch of, if anybody's interested, I'll tell you what they are. You can run a lot of tests right in Google Sheets with these free add-ons. Um, if you ever collect zip codes, it's really good to do that in surveys. You can really easy run that zip code column and Google Maps will kick out a map with all the points on it. We did that for one class, it looked really good because it was a distance ad. We had data from all over the state showing on there because of the zip codes. So there's a lot of things in Google Sheets that I'm learning to, to do also. But a lot of it's just playing around with that and trying to figure out what, what we want to do and what we can do. Most of it's free. The sentiment analysis in Google Sheets is called Alien. And that's a new startup out of Ireland. And I talked to that guy, he might zoom into the class because they're trying to grow that business. So that's a that's an add-on to Google Sheets too. So you can play in there. I've played it, it works okay. Can't think of anything else I'm looking at. It's really super interesting. And that quote's pretty cool. How's that going? <coughs> we should get some field trips, right? I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, we only have four times this semester, but nobody in exam four is willing to like, vocalize that. So one thing that I wanted to present to you is the idea of like, if we had like one person on exam four being like, sort of like liaison coordinator, and then that person could like start grouping with the other like students, so that way it's like the exact board, they don't have to be in charge of it doing that. They just have one person like in constant contact with other people. So like I could like talk to other members like in the group and like let them know. So that way they can do their own thing. We can talk about that. I have two opinions on that. Yeah. Um, there's some, oh, there's some, I'll tell you one other, as I have time on that. Those same wellness items, I was working with the university, you know MapWorks, have you all done that? Mm -hmm. I got those in MapWorks, same thing, just junk. They did not test well. And here's the other thing I found, you know, if you're cleaning data, you, know, you gotta clean the data before it'll run. They didn't give me any names, right? But I got like thousands of maps. There were so many missing fields, I have. So here's the question, if you go, they're missing, there's a bunch missing. You clean out all those cases and just throw out all the ones that are missing. Let's say you got to clean out 70% of your cases because they're missing. Or you go into Google Sheets and plug it in, hit the randomizer, and it'll, it'll randomize all those stuff. It'll fill in everything. So what would you do? What do you think? Now, in real research, they'll do that. I know if there's millions of cases, they'll random, they'll fill in up 20, 30% sometimes, randomize just to fill the holes. But in our research, do you think you should throw out those cases? Or should you go ahead and randomize? Fill them in. It's a judgment call. What do you think happens if you just let it randomize? Because I can set Google Sheets to one to, let's say one to five scale. I just set a one to five. It fills it all. Ram controls Ram. the outcome. Because it's not a real one. It's not a real four. It's not, it's just going boom. It's throwing them in there. So really, it really skews your data, right? It's not real answers. But some would say, I want to get this thing running, and I don't want to throw out all those cases. So I, in the MapWorks study, I threw out, I threw out hundreds, of, but I still had several hundred or more left. But there was a lot of holes in there. But the point is, when you test it again, that's called test re retest reliability, scale was junked twice, right? So that means I know now that scale will never work right together, because two different times it didn't, it didn't test right. So then you have to do something else with it. You can also use decision trees on it because then it's just taken variable by variable. It's not about using it together. This one was never quiet here. Mm -hmm. Do you like egg salad? Egg salad? Is that a survey question? No, it's just a, well, I guess it's a qualitative question. I'm always afraid it's bad. Like if I make my own, yes. Right, right. But if I buy it somewhere, I think how long has it been sitting in that bucket? <laughs> okay, so like qualified. So do you think partially, like with process, like salads such as that, do you think part of it is you know how long it's sitting out, like actually in the bins, and actually like people are going up at your, you know, you know, like Publix or like your hair to your Lowe's, and like it should it be a thing like obviously there's, every produce is being constantly things, but do you think there's that? that social or it's that psychological book, oh, this has been there like the whole time. Well, that's your guess. I think it matters, but again, I, that's me. I don't know what I'm doing here. So you would test a couple hundred people and you would know very quickly out of research. 
there's a real strong perception of perception of how old